Okay, so today I've been asked to uh, give a talk on the Dhamma, on the Buddhas, on Buddhism, <coughs> and at the same time I was invited to partake of my daily meal here. I've been asked to talk, or I was suggested that I talk about the uh, first verse of the Dhammapada, which some of you may, some of you are definitely familiar with. The Dhammapada is a set of verses, 423 verses taught by the Buddha, or <coughs> they are summaries of teachings that are easy to remember. So they give us an idea of what it was that the Buddha taught. And the first one goes, Mano Pubangama Dhamma, Mano Seta Mano Maya, Manasache Padutena Bastiva Karotiva, Tato Nang Dukkaman Veti, Chakkang Vahato Padang. which means the mind comes first. The mind comes before all dhammas, or literally all dhammas are preceded by the mind. They are governed by the mind and made by the mind, formed from the mind molded by the mind. So if one acts or speaks with a defiled mind, suffering follows one just as the wheel follows the hoof of the ox that pulls the cart. This is a good description of the essence of Buddhism. As I think about it, it's a good way to introduce Buddhism for those people who are not very familiar with the details of the Buddha's teaching. If you want to understand the core of Buddhism, one good way to understand it is to understand the importance of the mind and how reality is based on the mind. <coughs> what this means is that one's experiences and the impersonal world around us are not the most important thing. What is important is our, our, our reactions to the world around us, our mental activity based on the world around us. It's not even important what we do or what we say so much as what are the intentions behind our actions and our speech. So in the Buddha's teaching there is no room for ritual or superstition.
and there is no there's no room for excuses but what this this is a good thing actually what this means uh, means that you can be free from suffering anywhere you can be happy in any situation because the physical world the situation in which you find yourself is not responsible for your suffering and your happiness the worst the physical world can do to you is bring physical pain or, or, or dis, displeasure, discomfort. It can't bring mental suffering. But likewise, ha the world is not responsible for our happiness either. Curiously enough, Happiness doesn't come from the world around us or our experiences of it. Happiness and suffering come rather from the mind. This is a very powerful teaching. Maybe it's not clear at, at first blush what, how powerful, how important it is. But what it means is you can be happy anywhere. What it means is that you can, if you follow these teachings properly, become invincible. If it's true, if you accept as true that happiness depends on happiness and suffering depend on the mind, then you can become safe. You can find a true refuge from all suffering. Because no matter what the world throws at you, what the changes you undergo in your life or the problems you face, they're all physical, they're all external. It also means that, well let's go through, I'll go through the things that it means. You can understand this verse in five ways. The first is in regards to uh, good deeds. So, for example, charity. You can understand the importance of the mind in regards to charity. Giving gifts, giving support, helping people, doing good deeds. What does it really mean to do a good deed? For some people in some religions it means ritual. You undertake certain ritualistic activities and these are considered good deeds. So in the tradition I grew up with we would light candles uh, during this time of year and somehow think of this as a, a good deed. But, it's, but when you study, even, even that as an example, for many people it's just a ritual where you light the candles and that's it. But for those people who study the tradition, the Jewish tradition, for example, they know that actually it's a means of remembering, uh, remembering an important part of their history. So it's, it has some importance in the mind. There's actually nothing special about lighting candles. But still people do it ritualistically and, and every Friday night we would light candles. And our Friday night candles didn't mean uh, anything to us for the most part. They were just a ritual that we performed. And they were considered to have been uh, ordered by God. In uh, Hinduism, which some of you are familiar with, there's been a long history of ritual. And Buddhism doesn't teach this. Buddhism teaches that the ritual itself is not important. What is important is where your mind is. And there's nothing wrong with ritual. 
There's nothing wrong with, with religious activities as long as they're wholesome. Of course, sacrificing goats and uh, other animals is unwholesome and, and, and the sort of ritual that is definitely uh, a cause for suffering. But if it's just ritual activities, lighting candles, ringing bells and so on, there's nothing wrong with that, depending as long as your mind is in a good place. If it's a means of focusing your mind and cultivating wholesome mind states, then that's perfectly valid. But much better than that are the good deeds that we do. And so people in, misinterpret this verse to mean that it's, it doesn't matter what you do, you don't have to do good deeds. You don't have to do anything, you just have to train your mind through meditation practice. But unless you can practice meditation all of the time, then most likely your mind is going to fall into unwholesomeness. You'll become stingy and, and greedy and chase after things that you want and uh, deny other people the things that they need. You know cling on to things and hoard things and deny others a share in your happiness and so on. And this is how the world works. We, we tend to uh, guard our own treasures and live in fear that others might take a part of it, take a part of what we have gained. And so this leads to suffering in the world. It leads us to live in, in discord, you know, where the people who have are always afraid that the people who don't have are going to try to take a piece of what they have. And people who don't have are always resenting those who have. And our minds are never at peace. We never find true happiness. So the Buddha taught giving, he taught charity as a means of giving up, as a means of letting go, as a means of helping us to find peace in our minds, peace in our hearts. And so the first way we understand the importance of the mind is in doing good deeds. If you want to find happiness, you have to cultivate happiness in your mind. And if you want to cultivate happiness in your mind, your actions have to be with a pure mind. You have to do good things, do things that bring happiness, things that bring you peace, things that help you to let go. So by giving, when we, when we open our hearts up to the benefit of others and thinking about them and, and how they, they are in need and what we can do to help them and to give to them and to support them, this is something that opens our hearts up and frees us from this fear of loss and this stinginess and this greed that clings to our hearts and keeps us from being happy. So good deeds are the first important thing in Buddhism. They're a basic practice for us that we should live by in our lives. If you want to be happy, you should spread happiness. If you want to find peace, you should let go, learn to let go of your desires and your stinginess and think about helping others, what you can do to make them happy, learn to let go. The second way we can understand the importance of the mind is in abstaining from unwholesome deeds, abstaining from killing and stealing and lying and cheating and taking drugs and alcohol <clears throat> because all of these things have an effect on the mind. If you kill, this is a, something that's, that hurts your mind. If you steal, this is something that hurts your mind. It makes you live in fear and anger and, and discord with your fellow beings. You don't want to die and you kill others. You live as a hypocrite. You live as a... a, a per, you live a, a perversion of, of harmony, perversion of peace and uh, 
the nature of the universe. If you steal, you upset others and you create more greed and, and intense greed such that you have no moral scruples nor no care for others. And again, you're partial to your own happiness. So you create some perversion of the nature of reality. And these things only happen when the mind is involved, though. If you step on an ant, the origin story of this verse that I mentioned, there was a blind monk and he was enlightened. But every morning he would go on, on walking meditation and one morning it rained very heavily and these insects came up out of the ground and, and he stepped on them in his walking path. So these monks came by and criticized him and said he was thinking of doing good deeds and here he was just, he was taking life. And the Buddha said he didn't have any, he didn't even know those, those animals were there. And so from a Buddhist point of view this makes it not karmic. This makes it uh, neutral. This means it wasn't true karma because there was no intention, there was no volition, there was no anger, there was no knowledge of the act. If we cheat on our partner or if we tell lies and try to swindle others, this upsets the mind. You can't say that these things truly make people happy. People say when people when someone steals or lies, then they they can live lives of of great happiness. When I first came to Sri Lanka, I was given into the care of a man who is the son of a very well-known wealthy businessman here in Sri Lanka. If I said his name, you many of you I'm sure would already, would know who he was. I was given into the care of his son and people would give money to his son to take care of me. And eventually I realized that the money wasn't being used for my benefit at all, that this man was actually taking it for his own benefit. And so I ended it with him. But if I think back on this man, I found out later that he was a real crook and he had been stealing money from many, many Buddhists from different Buddhist places and running scams and so on. But if I think back, this man was certainly a very, very unhappy. Apparently he has uh, mistresses and he gambles and so on. And people who indulge in these things are, not, are, are much more unhappy than most of us who don't engage in such things. Engaging in immorality doesn't make you happy. I think there are very few people out there, gamblers or uh, hedon hedonists, who can tell you after some time that they're happier than when they started. They may say it to, the, to your face, but inside they, can, they have to admit to themselves that they're desperate. They cultivate addiction to such an extent that they need rather than want. And they can't stop themselves from craving, from chasing after things that don't actually satisfy them. And people who take drugs and alcohol will, will also tell you, you know, alcoholics, alcoholics are certainly not happy Anyone who knows that they are an alcoholic will tell you it's not really um, making them happy, but they can't stop themselves. They're in a desperate state. So if alcohol is something that's supposed to make us happy, why is it that people who take it get into desperate straits? The truth about alcohol and, dr and drugs is that they can, um, they can remove our sense of shame, our sense of fear of wrongdoing. And so we think that that's a good thing because now you don't feel ashamed, you don't feel awkward, you can do whatever you want really without any repercussions. You know? 
but in fact the repercussions are stronger they're just not uh, one's uh, one's mindfulness of them has disappeared has been taken away and so one one engages even more strongly in unwholesomeness when one is drunk when one is under the influence of drugs or alcohol whereas normally one might hold back and uh, stop oneself in engaging in wholesomeness, uh, unwholesomeness under the influence of alcohol and some drugs one has no such inhibitions and will engage in all sorts of unwholesomeness with a f uh, with the full weight of one's heart and one's mind behind So in regards to unwholesomeness, we, we have to understand that the mind comes first. You don't have to worry about the things you do or the things you say, but you should worry about where your mind is. Concern yourself about the nature of your mind, because that will inform your actions, inform your speech, and that's what will lead to suffering. It's not what you say or what you do, it's how you say, why you say it, and why you do it what leads you to speak, what leads you to act. Because angry people or greedy people, they, they destroy themselves all the time, they hurt themselves all the time. Even with, with ordinary actions, someone who is very angry will act rashly. The same action that an, a calm person would perform in peace, an angry person will perform in discomfort, uh, straining themselves, often harming their bodies due to their anger. And someone with greed has a clingy personality. In the same way they will act in a clingy sort of way. And they will harm their bodies, they will bring harm to themselves by overeating or by abusing their bodies in the search for happiness. And so they actually suffer more. So the Buddha taught us to be moral. He taught that we have to train our minds to see through our desires, to be able to be patient with the things that we want, patient with the things that we don't want, and to find peace and happiness outside of, outside of the external world or inside ourselves. The third way we can understand the importance of the mind is in regards to rebirth. If we talk about uh, what happens when we die. Now modern, modern theory is that when we die there's nothing. Modern theory says that the mind is the product of the brain. And so this worked well for many hundreds of years when we thought that there was an impersonal universe, but there's some, some science now that is casting serious doubt on this idea. If you study the, the origins of quantum physics, the people who discovered and, and were the founders of quantum physics said that actually it's the observer that comes first. They actually discovered what the Buddha had already taught, that the mind comes first. It's based on the mind that you then, based on one's observations of reality, that you can then discuss and talk about the nature of the, the universe. But regardless of whether science ever figures things out, It's really quite ridiculous to think that the brain could create the mind. Because we don't even know what the brain is. We don't even have a, any proof that the brain exists. We don't have any, uh, any reason to believe that the physical world exists. Why do I say that? Because it's based on experience. The only way you know that the, the brain exists is because you see it or you 
you think about it, or if you, if you touch it, then you can feel it. But all of this is experience. It's all based on the mind. It's the mind that comes up with the name brain. It's the mind that comes up with the image of the brain. It's the mind that studies the brain. Without the mind, what would it mean to say there is a brain? What would it mean to say that the brain exists? So the Buddhist theory is that we have reality of here and now, reality of experience. The very base of reality is experience. Whether you believe there's something outside of experience or not, the only way you can study that is using experience. So experience has to come first. Right? If we talk about the existence of the brain or the nature of the brain or neuroscience or so on, we do so in, in the context of our own experience, trying to interpret our experience in such a way that it can take the experience out of the equation, which is kind of strange, kind of like uh, gymnastics or yoga of some sort, twisting ourselves out of, tying ourselves up in knots. So if we take experience as the basis of reality, then we can see that it's continuing on every moment. Sitting here, you'll have the experience of hearing my voice. You have the experience of hearing the sounds in the room. You can feel the air conditioning on your skin. You feel the floor underneath you. You have the pain from sitting still so long. <coughs> You have the, the thoughts in your mind running rampant, taking you back home or to work, into the past or the future, into fantasy or, or illusion. And you have your emotions, your likes and dislikes. Maybe you're happy to be here, maybe you're bored, maybe you wish you were somewhere else. Maybe you're tired, or maybe you're distracted, maybe you're confused, maybe you're worried, whatever your state of mind is, that's going on moment by moment by moment. This is real. You can't say that this doesn't exist. This is actually happening. What it actually means is up for debate, but it does actually exist. Something exists that we call experience. So in Buddhism we say this continues on, and this is all that we know. We don't know what happens at death, most of us, but we do know that this experience continues on and on and on. So what we say is that based on what we know, our experience should just continue on forever until we find some reason to believe that it's otherwise, that, uh, believe otherwise. We should continue to believe that our mind will continue on and go according to cause and effect, building up good habits and bad habits, and changing according to the things that we do and say and think. So that's how we understand rebirth in Buddhism. When the body dies, we don't consider that to be important, or we don't consider that to be uh, uh, definitive, because it's just physical. It's not, it's not actually happening in terms of experience. Experience isn't dying. The body, the cells in the body are still there. They're just uh, falling apart and the system is collapsing. But that's a system of the physical world, not of the mental world. So at that time there are changes that occur, but it's like waves in an ocean. You see the waves crashing against the shore and you think that they're individual entities. But in fact, it's all just water building up and crashing. And life is like that. 
one human life is like a wave, it's a creation, it's an artifice coming out of the ocean of, of, of uh, reality. It's created and it crests and then it crashes and then a new one arises. So we talk about heaven. When we talk about heaven, we have to talk about it in this context. Heaven is not a place that you get sent to or you uh, go because of uh, a, your achievement. Heaven is a place you go to because of the nature of your mind. If your mind is heavenly, you go to heaven. If your mind is hellish, you go to hell. That, that at least makes logic, logical sense, whether you believe it's true or not. Where does a person with a hellish mind belong? In hell. Where does a person with a heavenly mind belong? In heaven. Anything else would seem ridiculous and unfair. And so we often find this criticism of religions that say good people can go to hell if they don't believe the right things. You know, bad people can go to heaven as long as they believe the right things. And we have this idea that it's unfair that people are born, some people are born rich, some are born poor. All human beings are born in a good state. Human, being born a human being is kind of a bit like heaven. Even for the worst of the worst lives in huma uh, as humans, where people suffer great suffering and torture, even this is... Uh, not as bad as the lower realms. But most, for most humans, living as a human being can be quite pleasant and there's a great potential for many things. You can become an evil person and you have the power to do it. You can become a very good person, you have the power to do it. We have the freedom to do it to do either good or evil, and, and mostly get away with it. If you do lots of evil, you can get away with it. So people think there's no justice. But this is, this is just because the person has the power. The person has come to the, heaven, the, the world of the human beings, and that in itself is a difficult thing that requires great goodness. But if they abuse that power, then they're changing their path. And when they die, they will go according to their deeds. They must. It, it can't go. It's like the physical world. What goes up must come down. You know. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. All of these different laws of nature are, apply similarly to the mind. You can't have, you can't plant apple seeds and get oranges. It doesn't make any logical sense. And if you watch in reality, you see that it doesn't actually happen that way. And so this is how re rebirth works. So the mind is incredibly important at the moment of death because that determines where you're going to go next. Where you're going to go is dependent on your state of mind. The fourth way we can understand the importance of the mind is in regards to is in regards to clinging. And so we talk about good deeds and bad deeds and the rewards of good deeds and so on. But as you look at it, you start to ask, where is this all going? And there's actually a, a greater lesson here. And the greater lesson is that in regards to all of this, this is still some kind of clinging. And no matter what happiness you get, no matter what heaven re heavenly realm you go to, it's still only uh, as powerful as the cause. If you worked hard to get in heaven, it's like working hard to get a good job. It still doesn't last forever. And so the Buddha taught this is the, the uh, disadvantage to clinging the disadvantage to clinging to pleasures is that they're impermanent. Even if you work very hard as a good person to try to gain good things, it can never satisfy you. 
because nothing is permanent, nothing in this world. Nothing that you get, nothing that arises will last forever. And so this is really the beginning of the, the Buddha's teaching, where it really begins. The rest is, is common to most religious teachings, but here we have this um, where Buddhism begins to really teach in earnest, and the Buddha's teaching begins to take shape. When we talk about the, the, the disadvantages of, uh, of striving for things in the world, even, of even being a good person, that being a good person isn't enough and it can't really make you happy, then you have to go further because the rewards of being a good person are still impermanent. Being a good person itself is impermanent. Who's to say that someday, some lifetime, you won't change and become a bad person again? There's nothing, nothing stopping that. So then we have the fifth way we can understand this verse. And that is in regards to renunciation, in regards to giving up sensuality. And this is how, why we practice meditation, or this is our practice of meditation. When we practice meditation, we're not trying to reject the world, we're not trying to reject experience. We're just trying to let it go and to become at peace with it so that we don't react or we don't cling to things, so that we don't force reality to be the way we want. Meditation is about letting go of our attachment. And so we practice reminding ourselves of the nature of things. When you're sitting here, probably many of you have pain in the body from sitting so long. You can focus on the pain and, and stop yourself from getting upset by it. Some of you might be thinking or, or uh, bored by now. So you can focus on the boredom. You wish you were doing this or doing that. You focus on that. And we just remind ourselves of the nature of it to try to help alleviate the suffering that comes from not getting what you want or getting what you don't want. And so we use a mantra to remind ourselves it's just a feeling to not get caught up in it, to not cling or react to it. When you feel pain, you can focus on it and say to yourself, pain, pain. Just reminding yourselves that it's pain. If you feel bored, you can say, bored, bored. If you're thinking about something far away, you can say, thinking, thinking. If, you're, uh, if you want something, you can say, wanting, wanting. Our meditation takes this shape of coming to be at peace with, with reality, of, of calming and cooling our minds and quieting our minds by clearing our minds. Clearing our minds means clearing our vision so that we can see things clearly and not cling to them. When something comes up that most people would find desirable, we just see it as it is. We don't cling to it, so we're at peace without it. Because we know that it's not going to last, we know that that can't satisfy us. When something that most people would find unpleasant comes up, we also don't cling to it, because we know there's no point in getting upset about it. That the problem isn't the object, the problem is our reaction to it. If we don't get upset, it can't hurt us. So pain, for example, can't make you suffer unless you get upset, until you get upset about it. This is the importance of the mind. And this is the essence of the Buddhist teaching, and I would say a good way of explaining the first verse of the Dhammapada. So that's the Dhamma that I would wish to give you today. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. And uh, maybe we also have time for meditation. Otherwise, uh, I guess you all want to have lunch as well. I'd like to say thank you for inviting me and uh, 
Thank you for being patient and sitting through the talk. And I uh, hope it was somehow interesting and useful. Are you twins? I think you have to think about it. If any of you are interested, I, I'll be here for a month. You're welcome to come and uh, study meditation. I can show you how we do meditation, walking meditation, sitting meditation. Um, uh, I have a question, I guess. Yes, sir. So, got an interesting uh, story about uh, the priest who was walking uh, on the ants, and mm -hmm. because he had no bad intention, it was okay. So, mm. I guess the, I don't know, my wife and I were talking, you know, sometimes in life we make maybe decisions with the best intention, and later in hindsight we realize maybe that wasn't the best best thing to do at the time. Yeah. Well, if you make a decision and someone dies as a result, <clears throat> if you didn't intend to kill the person, you're not, murder you're not a murderer. I mean, even I think the law understands that, but that's all it means. He wasn't guilty of, of murder, murdering those ants. Now, that doesn't say anything about his state of mind. So, if I'm driving my car drunk, I might uh, wind up killing people. And Buddhism say, would say that person's not responsible for murder, but they're responsible for a serious lack of, of uh, responsibility and a serious lack of, of, of uh, you know, disconnect from re a disconnect from reality, that they think they can just get in a car drunk and, and bad things aren't going to happen. So they're guilty of that. So when you make your decision, you're responsible for the mind states. You're responsible for your state of mind when you make the decision. And that can have, have repercussions. But if you didn't intend to kill someone, you're not a murderer. But you, you, you may be negligent and that leads to, to someone's death, even to death or, or, or pain and suffering for others. So all it means is that you're responsible for your, your state of mind. When you say best of intentions, it's easy to say, but, but what, what the, the truth, what's really important is the truth of your, your state of mind. If you're doing something out of greed, that's not the best intentions. If you're doing something out of anger or aversion, or if you're doing something out of delusion and, and, or conceit or arrogance, all of these things, that's what's important. So it's, it's important to make sure that you make decisions with the best of intentions. And the only way to do that is to have a pure mind. This is why meditation is so important. You know, we, 
we make sure to work out our bodies and train our bodies in our work so that we can we can use them appropriately but it's hard to find people it's not so common to find people who work hard to train their minds so that their minds work the way they want so that their minds bring them happiness and keep them from falling into suffering the mind the untrained mind is your worst enemy because it brings you suffering Two questions, please. Mm. First one is about concentrating on the pain, the physical pain. Mm. Does it actually go away? You want me to answer that one first? Yes, please. Um, the point of, of focusing on the pain is not to make it go away. The point of focusing on the pain is to realize that the pain isn't the problem. It's to be able to separate the pain from our reaction to it. So we focus on the pain and we remind ourselves it's only pain. We say to ourselves, pain, pain. That's just reminding you it's pain, it's pain, it's pain. It's not bad, it's not good, it's not me, it's not mine. It's just pain. And so the point isn't that it goes away. And that, that, that's not our concern at all. But you ask this, and people ask this because they don't like the pain. And that's important because that's what's causing you suffering. So you should also focus on that and try to pr cut that off. Don't let that proliferate. Say to yourself, disliking, disliking, or upset, upset, when you're upset by the pain. And you'll see that that is, focusing on those two things changes your whole outlook on, on pain, your whole outlook on the experience. So rather than suffer from it, you you live with it. You live at peace with it. And your second question? At the time of death, the mind can, depending on what condition it is in, can determine the place that where the mind goes to. Is that right? When it dies peacefully. Yes. Yes. Yes, um, it's a difference between someone who has a, a well trained mind and who doesn't. Someone with an untrained mind cannot really choose where they're going to go. They aren't, they aren't aware enough. So, whatever comes up at the moment of death, they'll cling to the first thing that comes along. Sometimes it's just like a roulette wheel, you don't know, a wheel of, wheel of fortune, you don't know what you're going to get. But a person with a trained mind can, in many ways, choose where they want to go, decide where they want to go. If you're, if you're you know, getting close to death, if you're sick and you're dying, you can take the time to consider where is most favorable to be reborn and can actually um, be prepared for death. And when it comes up, you watch, your memories come up, and you cultivate the memories and the associations that you are interested in. And that leads to a rebirth. That leads to the, the seed for the next rebirth. Sorry? Um, yeah, unconsciousness. Unconsciousness. It's, it depends. It's often caused by the body. You see, the body doesn't create the mind, but it filters it. So a body that isn't functioning well can actually prevent the mind from arising, and that can cause unconsciousness. Sleep is an example of this. Sleep depresses the mind's ability to see and hear and so on. But the mind can escape the body, and that's what it, in dreams or in... If some people, when you have lucid dreams, you actually feel like you've left your body and you're flying. Um, many people, if you've ever had this, it's quite exhilarating. You feel like you're flying and it's so real, it's so different. And the mind has actually um, freed itself from the confines of the body. At death, um, when the body breaks down, it's like the prison falls apart. 
and so the mind is free. So actually, the mo at, af after one dies, after the body stops working, uh, the mind becomes completely free and, and is able to experience everything uh, without fetter. With the, so the unconsciousness doesn't occur. This, uh, they, have, they have it documented now. They're doing studies on, on this phenomenon. And this is another um, piece of evidence against the idea that the brain creates the mind. Because they have people who have been brain dead for hours. It means the brain isn't working anymore. And yet they have perfectly vivid experiences and they can remember them. So they, these people are dead for hours and then the doctors are now, with advances in modern medicine, are able to bring them back to life. And then they, so, so more and more now they, they get these reports of people who were totally brain dead and had lasting and vivid and, and uh, real experiences when, they were, when the brain wasn't working. Um, so as far as unconscious, dying when you're unconscious, that has more to do with the nature of the body and how the body affects the mind than, uh, than the fact that the mind is, has, has stopped working. The mind is repressed. It's actually still arising, but it's just bawanga, we say, this, this mind that is just not really able to experience anything. So it continues on, but it's a very weak mind like the pilot light in a, in a stove. You know, the pilot light in a, in a gas stove. You know. Let's start with a person who has Alzheimer's and the person who dies. They see in the moment of death, plenty of mind disease. Yes, and Alzheimer's is also a, a, a brain disease. Yes. So it's um, the, the mind is being affected by the brain. There was this story of a woman who had a stroke and part of half of her brain stopped working and so she was talking about how it totally changed her mind and she had none of the judgments that were associated with that half, half of the brain. Those judgments just turned off. So the brain affects the mind to a great degree. It's only when the, the brain stops working that the mind comes back to its unfettered nature. So she was talking about when she, she went into this, when the, there was a, the brain just stopped working and she went into this state of pure bliss and just like she was God or something like that. And that's the sort of feeling that people get. If, if you talk to people who have had near-death experiences, they are by and large completely fearless. Uh, no fear of death, no fear of anything. They know they know, and I think it's wrong, but they know where they're going at death. They, they feel sure because they don't discriminate. They think it's going to happen the same way the next time. But because they've experienced it, they've experienced, what it means is they've experienced something beyond the ordinary. And that gives them great confidence. I think it's misplaced because you don't know what's going to happen next time. You, know, you, might, you might go to hell next time, but, but um, bec it shows that they had some experience that wasn't wasn't ordinary, and they'll tell you that. They'll explain this was like the most amazing, you know, just profound, and that was there was light and a tunnel, and Jesus came in. You know, it depends who they are. They'll tell you whatever they saw. But uh, it's quite a profound experience. Mm -hmm. Same thing, the mind is suddenly free. Mm -hmm. So you'll have, uh, you might have some disorientation, like what just happened to me, but uh, there will be a, a, a time of freedom where the mind is, is no longer fettered by the body. And during that time there will be memories and images and, and suggestions that one will cling to and that will lead to your next life. Where is it? Is the mind? Is it mind doesn't take up space. You can't say where is the mind. Physical space is, is see this, this idea of where is only, um, I don't know if it's really, but it's mostly a modern understanding. 
uh, it's not entirely true because we've always had the idea of you know in the bedroom in the in the hallway or so on but that actually is not the basis of reality that's only because of m the nature of matter uh, matter creates the idea of space and travel and so on but you notice how everywhere you travel you're still here right <laughs> It's almost like if I walk to the door, the door, the, the hallway moves around me more than I move through the hallway. <coughs> you know. Okay, is there anything else I can do? Are we... Uh, do we have anything else scheduled for the program? Okay. Thank you for inviting me and for offering me a wonderful meal. I appreciate your support and your interest in the Buddha's teaching. Um, I do a lot of teaching on the internet, so if you're interested in the things that I've been talking about, you're welcome to look me up on YouTube. And uh, YouTube's the best place. There's lots of videos up there. And I have a booklet on how to meditate. Um, I'm waiting for copies of it to come, but in the meantime, it's available on the internet as well. And I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, the practice that we follow is not to try to force the mind to concentrate. You know, even when, when your mind is distracted, then you focus on that as a state. Just say to yourself, distracted, distracted. And try not to let it bother you. Because worse than the distraction is the fact that it bothers you. And that it's unpleasant, so you have to focus on that. Try to be okay with it, and your mind will settle down by itself. meditation program all day, two-day meditation program, no? So you can talk to Sanka about that if you want to get involved. All right, then I'll let you go. Thank you for having me. I wish you all a good life, happiness and peace and success in your spiritual practice, spiritual path. <laughs>